Elizabeth, thank you for such a, a warm welcome in return. And it's still odd to call you Elizabeth. <laughs> Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, once said, one of the greatest evils of the day among those outside the proximity of the suffering poor is their sense of futility. Young people say, what good can one person do? What is the sense of our small effort? They cannot see that we must lay one brick at a time, take one step at a time. We can be responsible only for the action of the present moment, but we can beg for an increase of love in our hearts that will vitalize and transform all our individual actions and know that God will take them and multiply them as Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes. I am inclined to think our speaker would agree with Day on several matters stated in this quote. First, poverty and the suffering it causes is one of the greatest evils today. Two, young people like you and I love the idea of justice, yet are stunted by a sense of futility. And finally, through individuals pursuing justice and living justly, Christ will bring about restoration redemption, and reconciliation for all of creation. Tonight, we have the honor of hearing from one of the leading pastoral figures of my generation. Eugene Cho, a native of Seoul, Korea, immigrated to the United States with his parents at a young age. He grew up in San Francisco, attended University of California, Davis, studied psychology and theater, and received his theological education at Princeton Theological Seminary. In 2001, Cho and his wife Minhee planted Quest Church, an evangelical covenant church in Seattle. Quest is an urban, multi-generational, and multi-ethnic congregation striving to be an incarnational presence in a post-modern and post-church culture. Again, manifesting his entrepreneurial spirit, Cho, his wife, and their three children began a small grassroots organization focused on joining the fight against extreme global poverty. In 2009, One Day's Wages was launched. Today, over $5 million have been donated, and over 500,000 people impacted worldwide. The life and work of Eugene Cho exemplifies what it means to be a leader in both church and society. He is an activist for justice, an advocate for neighbors near and far, an author of the book Overrated, in which he poses the question, is this generation the most overrated generation in human history? Please join me in welcoming our final speaker in the Pathways to Purpose series, Eugene Cho. Thank you so much. I feel like I need to hire you from here on out. <laughs> the best introduction I've ever received. Um, man, it feels really great to be here, even though I've never been at Valpo University. Um, my introduction to Valpo is that I learned you always pick Valpo in your NCA tournament, right? No matter what, you always pick uh, Valpo. Um, thank you so much. Uh, to the staff here for welcoming me and for each of you for being here tonight. Um, I thought I would just share maybe a couple more things in addition to um, what was shared, just so that you have a glimpse, so that you're not listening to an absolute stranger. Yes, I was born in Seoul, South Korea. My parents were born in what is now called North Korea. My great-grandfather was one of the first folks to uh, become a follower of Jesus Christ in a small little village outside of a larger city called Pyongyang. And as a result, our whole household came to faith. My father was six years old when he fled south, not knowing that a war would break out. And so all the news that's going on right now around the peninsula is certainly very disturbing and alarming on many levels. But I immigrated when I was six years old to San Francisco and before you know it, my wife and I, we've been married now for 20 years. We just had our 20th anniversary. When I was a little younger, I was not very happy about my Asian genes. I looked so young. But now, 
I just love telling people I'm 47. <laughs> and not only am I 47, but our oldest daughter is a freshman in college right now. So we have three children, and my wife happens to be a marriage and family therapist. Pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> It means that she wins every argument in our family, is what it means. And this, I should not be saying this because it's recorded, but we had an argument today. <laughs> and she won, again. Uh, it's, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but therapists have a very important book as well. Uh, it's typically called the DSM book. It's a Diagnosis Statistics Manual. And it's amazing because when we get into an argument or discussion, she somehow is able to grab that book. Um, mysteriously, it lands on her hands. And as we're arguing, she'll say, hold on for a second, Eugene. I need to check something. <laughs> and she'll flip through the book and she says, Eugene, it says here that you're wrong. <laughs> and she wins the argument again. That's typically how things work out in our family. Um, Today, tonight, I'd love to just share a little bit with you about a glimpse of our story. And my hope is to share for about 40 minutes and then to extend some time afterwards to answer some questions that you might have. Um, over the past 20 years, there have been three main things that uh, I have felt called to, uh, in addition to marriage and family. I won't get a chance to share all of them, but I want to just share, give you a glimpse of those three larger uh, trajectories, if you will, of purpose in my life. One has been to be a pastor of an urban church in Seattle. Not that long ago, I think, when we did our first survey, our average age was about 24 for men and 23 for women. We had about 1,000 folks coming out to our church, probably now in their 30s, if you will, average age with lots of young people. And we're grateful that I get a chance to engage young people in our city called Seattle. We also run this humanitarian organization called One Day's Wages, which is what I'll spend the bulk of my presentation with. And then lastly, uh, get a, uh, we spent about 12, 13 years running a nonprofit community coffee shop music venue called Q Cafe in Seattle. Because one of the things that we learned that in a post-Christian society, it makes no sense to tell people, love your neighbors, if there is no vehicle or manner in which you engage your neighbors. And so as a church, we thought, what would be the most organic, authentic thing for us as a church in Seattle to befriend our neighbors? And it was to start this nonprofit coffee shop and music venue. Earlier, Dr. Woodward, is that right? Dr. Woodward, who's a philosophy professor here, came and said hello, and the minute he came up, he looked very familiar because he was a patron at Q Cafe. In fact, did some shows, I believe, at Q Cafe as well. And so those are the three things in which we've spent a lot of labor and dreaming and visioning and dreaming. But today I want to speak to you a little bit about the work of One Day's Wages. Now, I think you might agree with this. We live in a world and culture in which both out of privilege but also out of conviction, Many people want to impact and change the world. I can't tell you how many times, as a pastor or as a humanitarian, I have heard that phrase, change the world. If I got a quarter for every single time someone said that particular phrase, I would be very, very wealthy. Now, that's a good thing. Many people want to change the world. But it's not just relationships or just casual conversations. The statistics prove that we are living among generations right now in a time and context and culture where people want to find purpose in what they do, including making their environment, their neighborhood, their city, the larger world a better place than how they enter into. As such, I often hear our generation, and when I say our generation, I am trying to liberally put myself with you young folks as well, so all of us, I often hear our generation being heralded by the following phrases, 
quote, this is the generation that will accomplish something extraordinary. Or praises such as game changers or history makers and world changers are lavished upon people. I suspect that versions of such statements have been said of generations past and will be said of future generations as well. Now truthfully, these kinds of statements actually make for good motivational talks, like this one. They make for good sermons for those who go to church, and they make for good pathways for purpose talks. But we really do need to take a moment to pause. We need to be wise. We need to pray for wisdom. We need to engage, particularly changing the world, we need to actually engage that work with a posture of humility. Now, while I really do want to applaud the desire and good intentions of people, my desire is not for you to walk away feeling discouraged and beat upon, not at all. I want to applaud it and encourage it, but I also think that if we're asking good questions, I fear that if we're not careful, we might become more overrated because we might be more in love with the idea of changing the world than actually changing the world. I fear that we are more in love with the idea of justice than ourselves living justly. For many of us who are people of faith, when I speak at my church or other conferences or Christian campuses, I often ask the question, and it's a rhetorical question, how many Christians would actually raise their hands if we said, who here loves justice? All of us. It's part of the core identity for us as followers of Christ. We would all raise our hands in response to loving mercy and generosity and compassion and justice. But if we're not careful, we actually forget that there is a cost to justice. And I wonder if we're more in love with the idea of justice until there's a personal cost to us. And that's when we realize maybe we're more enamored by the idea. For example, we love the idea of reconciliation. In my brief time here at Valpo campus today, in a few organic conversations, I've heard the word reconciliation several times, and how can we not? It's part of our identity or calling. God invites us into the ministry of reconciliation. We love the idea of reconciliation until we realize that reconciliation actually involves the hard work of confessing, confronting, truth-telling, repenting, dismantling, forgiving. Woo! That's a lot of hard work. I fear that we might be more enamored with the idea of changing the world and neglecting to allow ourselves to be changed. Another way to put this is the following. I fear that we're asking God to move mountains, forgetting that God also wants to move us. In fact, it might be possible that you and I are that mountain that God wants to move. And that's the question that I want to pose to us, is that in our desire to change things, are we open to the possibility that God needs to do a work in us? If I'm losing you, let me give you a a metaphor. I love exercise, as you can tell by my physique. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) No. If I'm being honest with you, yes, I'm a pastor. I can't lie. I don't love exercise. I love the idea of exercise. And they're two completely different things. As an example, I used to have a gym membership for 10 years. I was part of a small local neighborhood gym. I can't even remember its name, but when we used to live in a suburb in Seattle called Linwood, there was this small little dinky, organic neighborhood gymnasium, 
And it was amazing because it was $9.95 for kind of a communal gym. And the thing was, this company called 24 Hour Fitness came in, bought them out, but by government acquisition laws, they had to grandfather my rates in for life. <laughs> and so I thought to myself, $9.95 for all access to 24 Hour Fitness is pretty good, but for 10 years that I had a gym membership, I went to the gym once. And that one time that I went was to give them my credit card bill. Ten years. We have a treadmill in the basement of our home. It's covered with coats. I haven't been on it for years. I subscribe to health magazines that mysteriously download from the cloud onto my tablet. We have lots of gadgets at our house. Ab busters, thigh busters, butt busters, I mean, the list goes on. And the thing is, I can tell you about exercise, I can actually speak to you about exercise, I can probably lecture to you about the benefits of exercise, I know the physiological and even emotional, mental benefits of exercise, it is also radically different than exercising. It's a trick question. How many calories do you lose thinking about exercise? <laughs> I'm just going to do 10 push-ups right now. <laughs> well, obviously the answer is zero. But that's a metaphor that we might know that doing good and engaging justice and engaging reconciliation and being merciful and creating civic discourse and the list goes on. We can believe these things are good, particularly as followers of Jesus. It's a radically different thing to actually live and embody these things. In the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, there's a beautiful story about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Now, I suspect that some of you, many of you, are very familiar with the story. It's one of those stories in the Bible that are somewhat transcendent, meaning folks in the larger culture, they might not necessarily be Christians, but there's few stories in the Bible that they're aware of, and that's one of them. What I love about that story is that verse 4 of the 4th chapter of the Gospel of John says that Jesus had to walk through Samaria. Now the thing is, Jesus didn't have to do anything because he's Jesus. He can do whatever he wants. He's Lord and Savior. He's the cornerstone of all things. He's the risen Christ. But everything that he does has a purpose. Every word that he says, every child that he welcomes, every person that he forgives, it all gives us a glimpse of the vast beauty of the kingdom of God. So we got to pay attention. So in that verse, when it says, Jesus had to walk through Samaria, it's interesting to note that during the time of Jesus, escalating from centuries after centuries of conflict that really arises from 2 Kings and the Old Testament, where they began to see Samaritans as half-breeds and therefore dirty and contaminated and villainized and demonized, what ended up happening is that when people from the south needed to get to the northern part of the map that you see in the end of your Bibles, what people did is that you did whatever you could to avoid walking straight from point A to point B because in the middle was something called Samaria. Now, this is very simple math. If I'm right here and I want to get to the back of this particular conference room because I see an exit sign there, we all know that the fastest way, the quickest way, the most efficient way for me to get from here, point A to point B, is to simply go on a straight line down this particular aisle. The problem was, during the time of Jesus, Samaria, occupied by those dirty, contaminated, half-breed Samaritans, were right in the middle. So what did they do? They actually traveled east, crossed a particular river called Jordan River, and they took a very circuitous route that scholars say took about three to three and a half times longer than that original point A to point B. 
My point is this. For us, as people that want to do good and make an impact and change, we can talk about Samaria, we can write research papers about Samaria, we can liturgize about Samaria, we can sing about Samaria, you can write uh, rhymes and songs about Samaria, you can do lots of things about Samaria, it is still very different than actually walking through Samaria. This is my confession. When I wrote the book called Overrated, it wasn't a book that's intended to be a how-to guru, expert, here's what I can teach you. It's really a confession. And my confession to you, and I still wrestle with this, is that if I'm not careful, I'm more enamored by ideas and thoughts and dreams rather than living, embodying, pursuing these things out even when there is a cost, opposition, setbacks, pushbacks. And so the question again is, are we more in love with the idea, vision, dreams, convictions, purpose that you have in your life? This became very uh, tangible for me in my own life when I had a chance to visit a country called Burma slash Myanmar. Now, prior to going to Burma, the only thing that I actually knew about Burma was there was a band, you may have heard of them, called U2, that wrote a song called Walk On as a tribute song to a woman named Aung San Suu Kyi, who back then, when I first visited, about 1994, around, that, around 1997, I believe, is that she was incarcerated under house arrest because of some of her views and convictions, because she was a leader with different views than the, governing, uh, the government at that time. And so for about 20 years, she spent a good chunk of those 20 years under house arrest. But we had a chance to go to Burma, Myanmar, because I was doing some research about issues of poverty. I wanted to learn more about my own personal story, learning that my parents were grown or living in abject poverty when they were children, the stories that my parents tell me about, the detriments of the war on land, on people in Korea. And so because of my past and because of some of my convictions as a follower of Jesus, I wanted to learn more about what local and global poverty looked like and how, as a person of faith, I could learn more and thus engage more. So we were in Thailand and went there and crossed the river into Burma slash Myanmar. And we were visiting a makeshift school in the jungles of Burma. The thing was, this village did not have even a name because they were constantly moving around from place to place, fleeing away from a military government that was trying to kill them. The United Nations actually put out a report many years ago saying that the genocide going on in Burma was as bad as that in Darfur, but people weren't aware of it because the numbers were on different scales. But the atrocities that were going on. And so when we visited this makeshift school, I just need you to use your imagination. Let's just say that this is a dark and scarred green chalkboard that's been so overused that you can see all of the things that have been inscribed on it for months and years and years. There were about 15 desks and chairs that were all makeshift, non-matching. Certainly not the nice facility that we're in right now. It was a classroom for first to fifth graders. And when I walked into this classroom, I'll be very honest with you, the first thing that my eyes went to was the chocolate. Because on the chalkboard was a poster about the size of this particular stand. And it was a collage of photos taped together. And it's one of the most violent, most <coughs> hideous, most heinous things I have ever seen with my own eyes. I walked in and I was so taken back by it that I probably reacted in a way that my host, seeing that, probably wondering if I was okay, but it was such a violent poster. Now you're probably wondering what it was. It was a collage of photos of men, women, and children, many of them 
with missing body parts and blood oozing out of them. Now, I'm not an educator, but in my mind, that's not appropriate for a classroom for first to fifth graders in front of the chalkboard. My host, sensing I was disturbed in his broken English, he says, Reverend Cho, Reverend Cho, come closer, come closer. So with a lot of trepidation, I, I come a little closer, and he gets on his knees, and he begins to point down to the bottom row in this collage of photos, and there are these grayish, greenish, metallic contraptions. And then he says to me, with a very stern look, he says, Reverend Cho, these landmines, we must teach children avoid landmines. It was just stunning. And to meet some of the survivors, including children of these landmines, was both heartbreaking and it was also an honor because these are all men and women, children created in the image of God. It was that day I was meeting one of the leaders in our village. Can I get some tech assistance here, maybe? It was working fine. I've just got a couple slides for you. We'll spend 10 more seconds on it, and if we can't get it, And so that day, I had a chance to meet one of the leaders of this particular village. And in our conversation, I asked him, what's challenging in your village? Probably not one of my best questions. But knowing that I had visited a school earlier in the day, this leader says, um, teacher salaries, paying hard. To paying the salaries of teachers were challenged. So I have to ask the question, how much are the teacher's salaries? He sticks out four fingers like this and he says, $40 US. So my first response was, $40 per day. And he laughed at me. And so I realized I had made a faux pas. And I said, I'm sorry, did you mean $40 per week? And he laughed again. And at this point, my head is like, mind blown. I'm sorry, do you mean that their salaries are $40, wanting to make sure nothing gets lost in translation, $40 per month? And his face turns so stoic, and by now I think he's really irritated with me. You silly Western man. And he says, no. Their salaries were $40 per year. Now, I'm not saying that to make you feel guilty or embarrassed or if you're striking right now for higher salaries at Valpo, I'm sorry. That's not the reason why, but to somehow also say that the work of gospel, the work of the kingdom, the work of justice is also truth-telling. We have to share about the vast disparity of resources and wealth that exists in our world today. In the year 2017, when we understand some of the great disparity that exists in our world. And so after this experience, I came back to my home in San Francisco, shared this with my wife and our kids. I had a great photo of my wife and our three kids. That's not even Photoshop that we look so good, we so impressed. <laughs> And so we spent some time thinking and praying about what we could do. And I share this not to sound boastful. So I hope that you can receive it and extend grace, that our desire is not to pat ourselves on the back. But after we spent some time in prayer, we came to this conviction 
that God was calling us to give up a year's wages of our household salary. The thing is, as a middle class family living in Seattle where it's very expensive with three kids who are eating constantly, <laughs> it was not an easy decision to come to peace with. It took me three years to come to peace. And during that three years, it meant simplifying our life, selling off things that we didn't need. It meant saving as much as we could. And after three years, we finally came up with $68,000. And with that, we started this organization called One Day's Wages. Now, I wanted to share a little bit about One Day's Wages before I speak to you about some practical things that you and I can do to kind of foster this culture and commitment, not just of loving justice, but living justly. $68,000 a year might not seem like a lot. I don't know. For college students, you're like, that's amazing. Feed me chipotle with avocado. Is that, is that what you Okay, great. I'm just obsessed with the avocado. It's always that moral conundrum. Do I get the avocado or not? Um, you're probably aware of some of the wealthiest people in the world. My friend, Bill Gates. In my mind, my imaginary friend, Bill Gates. <laughs> Warren Buffett is up there. Another local Seattle person named Jeff Bezos is up there as well. The thing is this, in a culture where we're constantly hearing you don't have enough, you don't have enough, you don't have enough, it's good to have a dose of perspective and realize in actuality, many of us, if you've ate at least one or two meals today, if you have a roof over your head, if you have clothes on you, and thankfully, all of us have clothes on us, it means that we're living amongst the most privileged folks in the world. My $68,000 a year, at least seven years ago, actually put me among the world's wealthiest people. My official rank, I was the 52nd million, 40,000, 162nd richest person in the world. You better respect me. <laughs> you don't respect me. That might not seem like a lot, but in terms of percentile, it puts me in the 0.86 percentile of wealth in the world. 0.86. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the realities of need that we have or our neighbors have, but it's good to have a sense of perspective. So what does it mean for us to uh, foster a commitment of trying to live justly? Well, this might sound like an oxymoron, but what we believe here and here translates into our hands. So I don't want to diminish the pursuit of intellectual thinking and the process of figuring out why we believe in what we believe. You're at a fantastic university that are helping you ask hard questions in hopes that when you leave, you're not just circulating those hard questions, but that it transposes into how we live our lives. In other words, for me as a pastor, I would say our theology matters. Why we believe in what we believe. A theology of justice matters. Let me give you an example. Let's just say on the stool here, there's a box. There's a real nice box, and I know you're not supposed to put God in a box, but for the sake of illustration, just stay with me. On this stool is a box, and it represents God's character. Now, I'm speaking not as a person of faith for people of faith. Because as followers of Jesus, it informs our identity. And in this box, there are things that represent the character of God. If I were to go into this box and extract love out of God's character, you would be furious because how can we speak of God without speaking of God's love? It's impossible. God is love. If we were to remove uh, grace out of the box, the only reason why I believe I'm alive is because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened 
in our Christian theology, what happened in our denominations, what happened in our institutions, what happened among Christians where somehow we've extracted justice out of God's character and then called it an agenda, a political issue, a leftist thing. When we read the scriptures in the Old Testament, there are over 200 references of God and the three variations of the word justice. Isaiah 61, 8, I, the Lord, love justice to restore that which is broken. And I use the word justice broadly to help us think about that which might be broken in our families, in our neighborhoods, in Indiana, in the Midwest, in our country, around the world. And the work of justice is to acknowledge it and by God's commandment and invitation, we participate in that work of reconciliation, <coughs> restoration, and justice work. See, our theology of justice really matters. It's our theology of justice then translates into our hearts. We have to care. People often ask me the question, Pastor Eugene, how do you wrap your mind around so much brokenness in this world? Now, you don't have to be some sort of a scholar to know that there's a lot of brokenness in our world. All you got to do is turn on your smartphone and check social media feeds and the 24-hour non-stop channels. 470,000 Syrian lives have been killed in the last six years since the start of the Civil War. There's approximately 36 to 46 million human beings that are caught in some form of human trafficking, including sexual exploitation in the world. Because of the work that we do at One Day's Wages, I've had the, I can't even call it a privilege. I've had the burden of visiting one of our partners in Thailand, and one of the work that they do is that they do the long, laborious, hard work of visiting brothels to try to identify girls that have been abducted or forced or coerced or bullied that are underage into prostitution. And so for one of our work, they invited us to come and join them. And so I asked my spouse for permission if that would be okay. And so we went along with my operations director, several of their staff, and we visited for several hours, brothel after brothel after brothel. And there's one that I remember so distinctly. There was this big platform elevated stage where approximately 80 to 100 women, young women, are up on stage. And every single one of them they simply have a little number by the side of their body on their bikini. Half of the women are topless. Half of the women have shirts. And all they do, like zombies, with a fixated smile, is just dance to the music back and forth. And as part of the research, what you have to do is muster the guts to look for someone that looks particularly young, and all I can remember is 18. Number 18. And so you ask the hostess with a little gesture like this, and she comes and you give her a number. Number 18. And number 18 walks down from the platform and sits right next to you along with your team, and you're trained to ask a few questions. And sometimes I still pray for number 18 because I don't want to refer to her by a number, but I want to remember her face. How do you wrap your mind around so much brokenness in this world? I mean, I can spit out statistic after statistic, locally, domestically, nationally, internationally. There is still so much brokenness. How do you wrap your mind around so much brokenness? I would contend with you, you've got to begin with your heart. In other words, you've got to care. In other words, you've got to give a damn. In other words, we have to actually be intentional about fighting against the culture of desensitization that happens, at least in my life. I, I can't speak for you, but I know for me, it's so tempting to be desensitized to pain and suffering. 
So our theology of justice matters. The second thing I want to share with you is that we need to look into the eyes of humanity. Um, you probably know this. When you want to acknowledge someone, you have to look at them in the eyes. If you want to avoid them, you avoid making eye contact. That's why in my family, when I say, who's doing dishes? It's amazing. All three of my kids all look away. They're afraid to make eye contact. At my church, who here wants to volunteer to throw out the trash and clean our fellowship room? It's amazing how they all look away. I always call the person that looks away the first. Just an FYI, don't look away. See, when we look at someone, the reason why it matters is because when I see someone, I'm saying, I see you. I acknowledge you. I believe in your value, in your dignity, in your humanity. I believe as a person of faith, you are created in the image of God. And this is the reason why sometimes we're tempted to not look. The reason why you and I must look into the eyes of our neighbors, including those that we're seeking to help, is that if you stop looking at them, you will end up reducing people into projects. And God did not intend people to be your project. When I was a college student some years ago, I was a double major. And uh, the thing was, I was horrible in theater. So I ended up with a degree in psychology. And I realized that it was really hard to get cast for productions. I was cast for two, two plays. And in one of them, I was playing a homeless person. My director, who was great, but was also known for being very blunt, comes to me after practice and says, Eugene, you're horrible. You're jumping on the other person's lines. You don't understand this person's tension, this person's narrative, this person's story. And if you take your craft seriously, I want to release you from practice for a week. And I want to challenge you to live out in the streets. Now, I took my craft seriously, so I did. I went back to San Francisco, two hours away from UC Davis, and there's a, a very prominent street called Market Street in San Francisco. It's kind of the financial shopping district, and so I parked myself using some stereotypes that I have about homeless folks, dressed a certain way, had a cab, had a sleeping bag, made myself a sign, and I sat in front of a department store called Macy's on Market Street. Did not survive a week. It's too hard. Four days, three nights. And for those four days, three nights, literally thousands of people pass, walk past me. Thousands of people walk past. And every now and then, someone would like go into their pockets and like throw change my way. So I made barely enough to get by. But what I remember to this day that has really shaped and informed the way I want to live my life is that for those four days, three nights, thousands of people walking past, nobody would look at me in the eyes. Nobody. And I've never felt so invisible, so insignificant, so inconsequential. And I wonder if it's because we as human beings, we feel like our job is we have to fix everything or we can't look at people. I wonder if Mother Teresa was on to something when she said that the greatest disease in our world, the greatest malady, is loneliness. It's when we're unable to acknowledge the humanity of each and every person. Can you imagine how important this is in the work of philanthropy or justice where it's easy to somehow use our resources as a white Asian savior complex against others. Or in our digital culture where it's so easy, how many times, let's just be honest, don't raise your hand, have we looked at our phone in order to avoid the discomfort of acknowledging people around us? I need to wrap up soon, but there's a Nigerian novelist by the name of Chimamande Adichie. And some of you might be familiar with her work. I mean, she's brilliant. I love her words. I love her TED Talks. But in one of her TED Talks, she gave a particular presentation about the danger of reducing people into projects. This is what she says. The single story creates stereotypes. 
And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. Stories matter. Stories, many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. This is the reason why I was so, so overwhelmed when I received a letter from a colleague doing nonprofit work in South Africa when he wrote me a very pointed, personal plea and letter. And this is what he wrote to me. Eugene, we know you run a development and humanitarian organization. Thank you for your work. But as you share the stories of difficulties and pain, don't forget to share the stories of beauty, hope, courage, and love. Please be responsible in your storytelling. Please tell your Western countries that the whole of Africa is not dangerous, warmongers, child soldiers, starving, helpless, and desperate. Please tell your folks that while we appreciate love and prayers and support, we are not in need of the Western white saviors or Asian saviors for that matter. I think that was for me. <laughs> We are proud, we are beautiful, we have a history, we have beautiful stories and songs. We are not perfect, but we too are created in the wondrous image of God. Watch the stories that we tell. I'm nearly out of time here. So the last thing that I'll say is that in our culture where there's so much information, there's a danger of not going deep simply existing on the surface. I've had so many conversations, particularly with younger folks, that are convicted about certain things. I once had a conversation with a couple of young men that were moved by the water crisis in Africa, which is not a bad thing. There is such a thing as a water crisis. A third of water wells that were built by hard, donated money are no longer functioning and they need to be rehabilitated. There needs to be training, and on and on and on. But when I asked them about the water crisis, I said, why do you care about water in Africa? Their response was good. We think everybody should have access to clean water. I said, great. Where in Africa are you particularly concerned about? It doesn't matter. I asked them, you know that it's not one country, right? There's many countries with many languages, many cultures. Do you have a particular place in Africa that you're drawn by, that you've studied? No, we just care about Africa. Have you researched other water solutions? Because for them, all they wanted, they were so fixated by the image of water gushing out of the water well which is one of many, many different water solutions that happens to be one of the costliest. But when I asked them these questions about rain catchments, about, about biofilters, and the list went on, they were unable because they were so fixated on a very thin veneer of information. When you care about something, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to that cause, to that purpose, you owe it to God to go deeper in your conviction. It's not enough to say, I read it on Facebook. I heard it on NPR, although I love NPR. I heard my professor say this. Those are all sources, but there's something about going deeper in our conviction about certain things. In other words, don't be afraid to be an expert on that which you feel called to. It doesn't mean that you have to get a PhD. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that we ought to dig in deep so that if we're speaking with a pastor, man, we can throw down theology with a pastor. If you're in an elevator with a legislator from Indiana, you're able to throw down conversations of legislation and good policy instead of saying, well, I care about this. 
It all matters. And I hope and I want to exhort you, if you care about something, and the thing is this, you're here, because A, maybe you get class credit for it, I'm not sure, but B, is because you care about purpose in your life, and you care about making a difference. Go deep. Thank you so much.